a University of Missouri student was chased down and murdered in 2004, leaving behind a list of ex and current love interests as suspects. But a Crime Stoppers tip turned the investigation away from other students and had the Columbia, Missouri Police Department investigating one of their own. I'm Charlie and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. This week's episode has been on my radar for a while since I saw it on where else but Forensic Files. The main sources for this, however, were legal documents and the newspaper archives, particularly reporting done by the Springfield News Leader. I feel like I'm always telling you my sources are old newspapers and legal documents, but that's because they are. Let's go ahead and get started. Jesse Valencia grew up on his family's farm in Kentucky, just outside of Danville. His grandparents had a house on the same property, so he grew up with his extended family all around him. He was a fun-loving and adventurous child growing up in the 1980s. One of Jesse's more quiet passions, though, was writing poetry, even from a young age. And when he moved out of the house and went to college, Jesse would actually mail his mother poems he wrote. He was very close to his mother and liked sharing his art with her. Jesse's path to the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, was not a straight line. He first went to a small liberal arts college in Indiana before he was spotted in Chicago by a modeling scout. Jesse signed with an agency and was a working model for about a year, and in 2000, when he was 19, he even landed a Gucci ad that ran in GQ. But Jesse decided that being a model wasn't what he really wanted to do long term. A gay rights activist, Jesse first went to MU to major in journalism, but then he switched to history as he prepared to go to law school. Jesse's advocacy came from his own life experiences. He came out to his mom at the age of 10, and he was scared to do that, but his mother, Linda, was supportive And that gave Jesse the confidence to be who he was. That included when he faced homophobic bullying in the 1990s in high school. He would stand up for himself, and he would stand up for others. And though Jesse dealt with this bullying from some of the kids at school, he didn't have issues making his own group of friends. Jesse wasn't an outcast by any measure. Jesse's larger-than-life personality drew people in, whether it was back home, at school in Indiana, or when he finally ended up at the University of Missouri. Jesse ended up working while he was at the University of Missouri. He worked at a cheap motel as the night clerk. But even on this college student budget, he would do things like leave large tips at restaurants and buy his friends flowers for no reason. The mother of one of his friends called him a Southern gentleman, but Jesse was also pretty funny. He threw himself a 21st birthday party in February of 2003. The only thing was he was born in 1981, so he was actually turning 22. The guests were mostly newer friends who he had met at school, so they didn't know how old he was and they weren't in on this joke, so they're all wishing him a happy 21st birthday, and he is thanking them for it. And it was just a harmless, quirky little prank that he pulled that amused him, and when everyone found out about it, made them laugh too. Jesse spent a lot of his free time hanging out with friends, and those were his plans on June 4th, 2004. 23-year-old Jesse got off of work at 11 p.m. and headed to a party at a friend's house. He called another friend named Ed, who he expected to see at the party, but wasn't there. Ed was a chef that Jesse had recently met, and the night before, they had spent the night together. When Ed left in the morning, he told Jesse he would see him at the party. But then Ed ended up flaking on those plans because he was tired and had to work the next day. So he was asleep when Jesse called to ask where he was. Ed's roommate, Eric, answered the phone and woke Ed up. Ed then decided to go ahead and meet Jesse at the party. This would have been between 11.30 and midnight when he got there. At some point around 2 or 2.30 in the morning, Ed and Jesse left that party and walked over to another one 
on the same street. This was a Friday night. It's a college town. Yes, there were parties probably in every other house on the block. The two only stayed at this party for about 30 minutes to an hour, and they left around 3 a.m. Ed and Jesse talked for a few minutes outside of the party, and Ed said that Jesse invited him to come over for the night. But Ed still had to work in the morning, so he said he couldn't, and they made plans for Sunday night and parted ways. At this point, it seems Jesse went back to the first party for a few minutes. Like we often see, nobody's looking at their watches while they're busy doing other things, so we have some approximations going on here. But we do know that Jesse was seen at the party alone after Ed had left. It's estimated it was about 3.30 or 3.45 that Jesse left to go home himself. The host of the second party that they went to actually saw Jesse walk by as he went home. They waved to each other. Jesse said he was going home to sleep. He was alone, and he was headed in the direction of his apartment. It was the next day, June 5th, 2004, which was a Saturday, and a man living down the block from Jesse left his home around 2 p.m. That's when he saw a person wearing only blue shorts or boxers lying on his lawn between his house and his neighbor's house. The man approached and saw that there was blood and flies all around, because this wasn't a drunken, passed-out college student. This was a dead body. He immediately called 911. When the police arrived, they did not find an ID, so they canvassed the area with a photograph of the deceased's face to see if anyone knew him, and eventually one person did. He said he thought it looked like Jesse Valencia. Jesse was found face-up with his throat slashed deeply, almost hitting his spine. The medical examiner immediately noticed that there was blood on Jesse's shoulders, but not much below that. The majority of the blood was on the ground under him. This led to her preliminary conclusion that Jesse was on the ground when he had his throat cut. But the Emmy noticed something else when she did the full autopsy. While there was bruising on Jesse's chest and between his shoulder blades, there were no defensive wounds on his hands or his arms. This is incredibly uncommon in a knife attack. So just imagine it. If you were lying on your back and someone is standing over you with a knife, you are going to grab for that knife. You are going to block your body unless you can't either because you're restrained or you're unconscious. The issue here was that there was not immediately apparent evidence of which of those two things it could be. There were injuries on Jesse's arms, but not consistent with being restrained. And there was no blow to the head that would have knocked him out. And there were no obvious signs of strangulation, in part because of the neck wound having obscured any of them. But there was odd bruising across Jesse's chest, on his back, and his jaw. Those were the most severe or significant injuries aside from the knife wound. Jesse also had petechial hemorrhaging to his eye and to his larynx, which are consistent with being rendered unconscious. It seemed like the best explanation that fit the evidence would be if someone tried to restrain Jesse from behind while he fought back. Jesse did have a slight build, so the other person wouldn't have had to be huge to be able to reach around him like that. As Jesse fought with his attacker, the other person held on harder, causing all that bruising on his chest and back. Eventually, the killer managed to get Jesse in some sort of chokehold that would have inhibited blood flow. Jesse would have been unconscious in 5 to 10 seconds, and then his throat slashed before he came to. The murder weapon was not found at the scene, but it was believed to have a serrated blade. The medical estimate time of death was set at between 3 and 5 a.m., though we know Jesse was seen at around 3.45. There is evidence that Jesse did make it home that night, which we will get into, so medical evidence, witness evidence, and circumstantial evidence all put together puts the time of death occurring sometime between 4 and 5 a.m. The medical examiner then sent various swabs, fingernail clippings, and the shorts Jesse was wearing to the lab for DNA processing. 
Meanwhile, the investigators at the scene were still piecing together the evidence there. After Jesse was identified, they went over to his apartment, which was down the street, and found that the front door was slightly open. When they entered, they found a messy apartment, but no immediate signs an attack had happened inside. They did get some more information from a neighbor statement, and while that brought the sequence of events into clarity, it actually added some more question marks to the actual timeline. The neighbor, a man named Christopher, lived immediately next to Jesse, and the two shared a thin wall. Christopher said he was out drinking late on the night of the murder, and when he got home in the early morning hours, probably around 3 a.m., he went to bed. At some point, he woke up to hearing a thumping sound on the wall he shared with Jesse. It lasted about two to five minutes, and the sound was going down the length of the wall toward the door. To Christopher, it sounded like some drunk person trying to make their way out of the apartment and falling into the wall, except for the voice he heard. He heard someone say, stop it, stop it, and he also heard what he thought sounded like, no, I'm not sleeping in the car. Though he couldn't make out much else of what was said, Christopher said he could tell there were two voices. He had only lived in that apartment for about a month at this point, so he didn't know enough to recognize Jesse's voice among these two voices. But this dialogue did influence how Christopher interpreted what he was hearing. To him, it sounded like someone had a drunk friend home and he was trying to get him to leave and the friend was resisting. That interpretation is completely based on the noises he heard because Christopher didn't see anything. He did bang back at Jesse's apartment, yelled at them to stop making so much noise, and the voices quieted down. He fell back asleep, and when he left his apartment around 10 a.m., he did notice Jesse's door was halfway open. So Christopher initially put the time of this argument, fight, whatever, at any time between 3 and 4.30 in the morning. But he had been drinking and just woken up to this noise, so this is a question mark timeline, and it will become relevant later. With Christopher's statement, the investigators were thinking that Jesse went back to his apartment after the party and someone came over. Someone he would have been okay being there while he was walking around in just his boxers. It sounds like Jesse tried to get them to leave, but they resisted. Or the person was getting rough with Jesse and Christopher misinterpreted the stop it and the bumping into the wall. Then, at some point, things escalated to where Jesse felt he needed to flee. Just in his shorts, with no shoes on, he ran out of his apartment to try to find safety. The other person chased him, eventually catching up with him down the street and killing him. It has been confirmed by a witness that Jesse left the party alone, so if Jesse had someone come over that night, he may have made those plans over the phone. Thankfully, Jesse's cell phone was found in his apartment so they could scroll through the call log. There were four calls from three different people that seemed possibly relevant that night. These calls were made at 12.01, 1.07, 3.13, and 3.18 in the morning. The first two calls, which came in about an hour apart, were from the same person, a man named Zev. Zev was a couple years younger than Jesse, and the two met at some political event. Jesse's friends characterized Zev as a love interest of Jesse's, but Zev denied this completely. He said they had only recently met, they hit it off, but it was just friendship. A witness did come forward and say that they saw a young man who looked disheveled walking down the street crying on the morning of the murder. The description given did sound a bit like Zev. And then someone else described a car they saw that day that also looked a little bit like Zev's car. But when the investigator showed an actual picture of Zev to the witness, they couldn't identify him as the person they saw. There are some reports that the picture they showed was a little outdated, but regardless, they couldn't identify Zev. Zev said he called Jesse to see what he was up to, and then he went to bed. Zev did live at home with his parents, and they confirmed that they saw him go to bed around 1.30. They would have been sleeping themselves when the murder happened, but they insisted 
they would know if Zev had left. His car was in the attached garage, and the noise from the garage door opening would have woken them up. I mean, I don't think this is enough to toss a suspect out, an alibi from the parents about a noisy door, and neither did the investigators. They gave Zev a voice stress test, which is a software program that is supposed to measure changes in voice patterns caused by stress or the physical effort of trying to hide your deceptive response. It's a type of lie detector test, but based on the studies of them, including one by the National Institute of Justice, they are largely crap. Flip a coin and you'll have nearly the same luck. The benefit to them is not necessarily the reading, but rather that the person you're interviewing thinks it's going to be accurate and they will be less likely to lie. Anyway, they did give Zev this test and he failed it. He asked to take the test again. Instead, they asked for his DNA, which he did provide. The next call of interest was at 3.13 a.m. This would have been right around the time Jesse and Ed parted ways, and the call was from Jesse to Ed. According to Ed's interview with the police, Jesse called him as he was walking home and asked him to reconsider and maybe come over for the night. Ed again repeated he needed to go home to sleep, and the two didn't have an argument or anything. They talked for about three minutes before they hung up and Ed went home. Ed said his roommate Eric was there when he got home and could vouch for what time that was and that he stayed home until work. And while Eric was able to say that Ed did come home at the time he said, Eric did leave the apartment at some point to go see his girlfriend, so he couldn't say for sure that Ed was home the entire time. It was possible he could have left. You might think we only have Ed's word that he turned Jesse down when Jesse called him. It sounds like he just as easily could have said yes, gone home real quick, and turned around and went to Jesse's. But there is some circumstantial evidence that that did not happen, and that's because of the next phone call at 3.18 a.m. This would have been around two minutes after Jesse hung up with Ed. This call was to Jesse's recent ex-boyfriend, Jack. Had Ed said yes to coming over, Jesse wouldn't have felt motivated to immediately make a drunken call to an ex at 3.18 in the morning. So I think we can say Jesse did not anticipate Ed coming over. And the investigators had already talked to Jack because he showed up at the crime scene crying after he heard Jesse had been killed. He told the police that they had been in a relationship and Jesse was having some trouble moving on after their breakup. Jack, however, had already started seeing someone else. Jack said he was already sleeping when he woke up to both someone knocking on his door and his phone ringing. The call was from Jesse, and it wasn't uncommon for Jesse to call almost like an intercom when he arrived at someone's house. So Jack assumed it was Jesse knocking and calling at the same time. But Jack was tired, he was in bed, and he really didn't want to talk to his ex at three in the morning. So he rolled over and ignored it. He told the investigators that he felt guilty because had he not done that, had he opened the door, Jesse might still be alive. Of course, there's no way anyone could have known how this night was going to unfold at this point. So it seems like after Ed went home, Jesse went to Jack's place. Then when Jack didn't answer the door, he went back to the first party, and then Jesse went home. If Jesse made arrangements to meet anyone else at his apartment, the clue to their identity was not in his phone. So the person had either stopped over unannounced or they had made plans in person. Then on June 6, 2004, the day after the murder, an anonymous Crime Stoppers tip came in that brought another man into the picture. The caller said Jesse was in a sexual relationship with a married police officer. Not just any police officer, but a Columbia police officer, the same department investigating the murder. The caller did not give the name of this officer. A quick look at the station's computer system showed someone had logged in before the body was found using a generic personnel number. They looked at the dispatch records, which would have indicated if a body was found. 
later that day, someone used the same computer again and checked the same thing. This was after the body was found. It could have been a coincidence. It may not have even been the same person checking both times. And there are other reasons a police officer may have had to check the dispatch log. But between the checking the log that day and the Crime Stoppers tip, they decided to go ahead and lock things down at the police department. The only people with any access to Jesse's case file or digital documents pertaining to it were the investigating officers. That may seem like a bit much based on one anonymous tip, except that Jesse's friends had backed up this tip, and so did his mother. They all said Jesse was seeing a police officer. Jesse did not know if the police officer was married, like the Crime Stoppers tip indicated, but he started to suspect it, and that's something Jesse just simply would not have engaged in and had zero tolerance for. He told his mom and his friends that he was going to confront the police officer about this and break things off if he was married. The friend said that Jesse met the police officer when he was arrested in April at a party. The arrest was honestly not a big deal. It was the middle of the night into the early morning hours when the police showed up at a party for noise complaints. On visits number one and number two, they told everyone to settle down and to be mindful of their neighbors. Then the police left. But when the third call came in, they decided on some stronger tactics. They handcuffed three of the people at the apartment until everyone settled down and then gave them all tickets. Jesse and a friend were outside of the apartment and they were told they needed to leave. They refused to leave, and I get the impression it wasn't just to defy the police, but rather Jesse was feeling a protectiveness of his friends who were currently handcuffed. Jesse intended to become a lawyer, so he asked why his friends were being detained, and he refused to leave. Since he and his other friend did not leave, they were handcuffed and put into separate patrol cars. They were both given a court summons for obstructing a police operation and then allowed to leave the scene as long as they actually left this time, which they did. Within 24 hours, according to Jesse, one of the police officers showed up at his apartment. He said he needed to ask more questions. But the questions he asked weren't about the party or why Jesse was there, but they were rather personal And then the officer came on to Jesse. The two ended up having sex. One of Jesse's friends thought the officer's name was Anderson. And one of the officers that arrested Jesse that night was named Anderson. The other two officers who arrested Jesse were someone named Stephen Rios and then a female officer. So she was obviously eliminated as the cop in question. A friend of Jesse's named Andy spoke with the police because he had seen this police officer. Andy and Jesse were friends who occasionally slept together when they weren't otherwise seeing someone else. Andy was over at Jesse's place on May 14th, and late at night, a uniformed police officer showed up out of nowhere. Andy was alarmed, but Jesse said it was fine and he knew the officer. So the cop came in and made advances towards a threesome arrangement. Afterward, when the officer was leaving, he told Andy not to tell anyone about it. So the investigators on the murder case brought Andy in for a picture lineup. They were just going to pretty much put the pictures of all the male officers out in front of him and see if he could identify any of them. They got back into the interrogation room, and Andy was visibly uncomfortable. He flipped through the photos without really looking at them. Eventually, Andy said he actually didn't need the pictures because they had passed the officer on the way to the room, and Andy had recognized him. You have to imagine how intimidated Andy was feeling in this situation. No wonder he was uncomfortable. The person they passed in the hall was not... Anderson, it was the other officer, Stephen Rios. So by June 8th, three days after the murder, the Columbia police were investigating one of their own. They were investigating Steve Rios, except they didn't want him to know about it just yet. They were still trying to keep things very under wraps. But 27-year-old Stephen Rios found out anyway. As much as they tried to shut off communication in the station, 
gossip about the Crime Stoppers tip went around and it reached Steve's ears. At around 8.30 in the morning on the 8th, Steve went to the supervising sergeant over Jesse's case. He said he heard about the rumor, and he was pretty sure the tip was about him. However, it was exaggerated. He was not sleeping with Jesse. Steve said he already disclosed everything he knew about Jesse on the day of the murder. When he was at the station during his shift around 6.30 that evening, he heard someone say they had a tentative ID on this victim as Jesse Valencia. Steve recognized the name from ticketing him at that party, so he said so. He said, I know him from this incident. So they had Steve go to the scene to positively identify Jesse. Steve was driven out there where they showed him the picture of Jesse they used to canvas the neighborhood. Steve said, yes, that's Jesse Valencia. Steve then went back to the station because he was still in his street clothes. He got his uniform on and he volunteered to go back and guard the crime scene. Now, if Steve had any sort of relationship with the victim beyond just giving him a ticket once, he should not have been at that scene at all. And Steve was insisting he didn't have any type of relationship with Jesse and that the Crime Stoppers tip may have been about him, but it was wrong. So that alone seemed kind of odd. Why would Steve think the tip about Jesse sleeping with a police officer was referring to him if all he did was ticket him? Why did he jump to that conclusion? So they asked Steve to sit for a formal interview, which he said, sure. Steve opened by continuing to deny any relationship with Jesse, but they stopped him there. They didn't just have this anonymous tip. They told Steve that one of Jesse's friends named Joan had come forward and said she saw Steve at Jesse's apartment in early May, which was over two weeks after the arrest. She had been at a party and had too much to drink, so Jesse told her to just go to his apartment, which was in walking distance, and spend the night there. She could drive home safely in the morning. So Joan went to Jesse's place while he stayed at the party. Around 3 a.m., there was a knock at the door, and Joan thought it was Jesse. Instead, it was Stephen Rios. He was not in uniform, but Joan recognized him because she was at that other party where Jesse got the ticket. Steve asked if Jesse was home, and Joan said no. He then asked Joan why she was there, and she said it was because she had too much to drink and couldn't drive home. So this police officer, who we now know as Steve Rios, offered her a ride home. But police officer or not, Joan was not getting into a car with a stranger at 3 a.m., so she said no, and the officer left. Confronted with this, Steve's story changed a little. Okay, sure, he saw Jesse after that party, but they were just friends. It wasn't sexual. So then the investigator stopped him again. They had Andy, who was an eyewitness to his sexual relationship. Steve acted shocked like he couldn't believe they were saying this, but then he eventually admitted, okay, yes, he had sex with Jesse Valencia, but it was only that one time. I mean, Steve was really trying it here, but they kept pushing. They had two witnesses and multiple people, including Jesse's mom, who said it was an ongoing relationship. And so then Steve, crying, admitted that, yes, he had been cheating on his wife with Jesse, and it had happened five or six times in the seven weeks from when they met until Jesse's death. But Steve said the last time he saw Jesse was six days before his murder. He had not killed him and hadn't even seen him. And they didn't have to take Steve's word for it because he had an alibi. Steve worked the overnight shift as usual on the night of the murder. He was done at 3 a.m., but he didn't leave. He changed and went to the roof of the parking garage to have a beer and chat with some other officers. This was not an uncommon thing for them to do, and he had multiple witnesses to it. Steve said he left around 5 a.m. The only time he was unaccounted for was when he went to the bathroom at one point, but he said he then returned to the group. Checking the station security locks, Steve did use his entry key at the police department 
at 437. And asking other officers, they did say they thought Steve did come back to the garage after using the bathroom. But they did contradict him on what time he left. They put it at more like 4.45 or 4.50, not 5 a.m. According to Steve's wife, Libby, he was home between 5.20 and 5.30. She remembers because their four-month-old woke up and she looked at the clock. She laid there for a bit to see if he would go back to sleep. And when he didn't, she got up to make him a bottle. She was in the kitchen doing that when Steve walked in. So she says it had to have been 5.20 to 5.30. Libby said Steve looked fine when he walked in. He didn't appear to be injured. He had no blood on his clothes. He just came home, picked up the baby, went and washed up, and then went to bed. So the question was, could Stephen leave the police station at 445, 450, confront and kill Jesse, and then arrive home by 520 or 530, like his wife said? The answer is maybe. It would be tight, a very tight timeline, but it wasn't impossible. And it did seem suspicious that it took Stephen anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to drive home, which took the officers trying to recreate all the routes only eight minutes. So he still had unaccounted time in this timeline. So we do have multiple persons of interest at this point, and all were asked for their DNA. We have Ed, the current and new love interest, Jack, the ex, Zev, the friend who people thought was more than a friend, Steve, the police officer who was having an affair, and then there were other friends who were also asked to provide their DNA. While all of that was in the lab, Steve Rios' name and connection to the case leaked in the media. And by leaked, I mean the police department confirmed it. Steve found out that it was published and had to sit down and tell his 21-year-old wife, the mother to his four-month-old child, that he had been cheating on her. Steve was then put on paid leave pending the investigation. He told his commanding officer he was going to Virginia to visit his father and that they could contact him there. And then Steve headed to the Kansas City airport. But instead of getting on a plane, he went to a Walmart and bought a shotgun. Then he called his wife and told her he intended to take his own life. She called the police and they came to the house, got on the phone with Steve, and talked him down. They talked him into driving home, which was a two-hour drive. They had no choice but to wait to see if he showed up. And he did. They brought Steve to the Mid-Missouri Mental Health Center and had him committed and put on a suicide watch. The next day, on June 11th, a nurse went into Steve's room at the hospital and he was gone. He had escaped, but he hadn't made it very far. He was standing on the ledge of a five-story parking garage across the street, threatening to jump. After a 45-minute standoff, they managed to talk Steve down again, and he was admitted into a more secure hospital. On June 16th, Steve Rios resigned from the police force, which was unavoidable. Even if the investigation completely cleared him in regards to the murder of Jesse Valencia, he wasn't going to come out of this with his job. Steve had met someone by basically arresting him, had sex with him within 24 hours, would show up and have sex with Jesse while on duty, and then he lied about it later. His career with the Columbia PD was done no matter how things proceeded. And Steve was becoming the lead suspect in the case, so it was proceeding like a barreling train towards him. Some investigators said that they were suspicious of Steve when he lied about the relationship with Jesse and tried to hide it. Others said they didn't really suspect him until he had threatened suicide. I personally don't think either of those two things indicate guilt over a murder, though. I mean, it doesn't point to his innocence either, but I think we can agree that Steve could have been trying to escape the consequences of something else. Internalized homophobia, shame over the public airing of his affair, the loss of his marriage and his career— 
I think all of those could be reasons why Steve lied and then was suicidal, not just because he was involved in a murder. So I guess it's a good thing that those indicators are not what led to Steve becoming the prime suspect. In the end, it was the DNA. Only two foreign DNA profiles were found and matched from Jesse's body. Ed's DNA was present in the sexual assault kit. However, that is to be expected because Ed and Jesse had had sex just a day before. Under one of Jesse's fingernails was a small amount of Ed's DNA and a small amount of Steve's. We're not talking blood or the amount you'd see if Jesse had really scratched his attacker hard. These were both very small amounts of DNA. Again, Ed's DNA could be explained by having been with Jesse the day before and again just hours before his death, but according to Steve, he hadn't seen Jesse in around a week. Additionally, three arm hairs were found on Jesse's chest that weren't his, and they were matched to Steve. Not hair analysis matching, but actual DNA matching since all three had the root attached. It seemed odd that Jesse would still have Steve's arm hair on him a week after last seeing him, and not just his hair, but the hair with the bulb attached. So let's talk about hair for a minute. Your hair has two phases, a growth phase and a rest phase. The growth phase is obviously while it's growing. After the growth phase, the hair goes into the rest phase where it snaps off at the shaft and is shed. Then it enters a new growth phase and the follicle starts producing another strand. The root of the hair stays in place when it's a natural shedding during the rest phase. The hairs on Jesse's chest, however, had the root attached, so that indicates they were pulled out, not shed. So even though more of Ed's DNA was found on Jesse's body, he could explain it by having just seen Jesse. Steve, at the time, didn't appear to have a really good explanation for this. Ed also didn't have a motive. He and Jesse had only recently met. They didn't have some sordid history or ugly breakup, and it's not like Ed was in the closet trying to hide a relationship. On the other hand, Steve may have had a motive. Jesse told friends not just that he'd break things off with Steve if he turned out to be married, but at another point, he said he was possibly going to report him to his department. This is something Jesse told Joan after his initial court appearance on the obstructing a government operation charge. Jesse went to court on May 20th, 2004, and pleaded not guilty. After this arraignment, Jesse complained to Joan about the charges. For one thing, he thought it was going to be tossed out because he and Steve were having some sort of relationship. Even if it was just sex, Jesse assumed Steve would have helped him out with a ticket. Another thing was that, from Jesse's view, it sounded like the charges were worse than he thought. The ticket was originally written as an obstructing a government operation charge, but when Jesse got to court, the prosecutor added some words to it, so then it read obstructing a government operation by physical interference. This was actually essentially the same charge. The prosecutor just added by physical interference because that was the wording in the ordinance that the case was being tried under. But Jesse didn't realize this and told Joan that the charge sounded more severe. So not only did Steve not get the ticket tossed, things were actually getting worse. Jesse said if the police officer didn't handle it, the next time he saw him, he would tell him he had a little secret the department might want to know about. About a week after that, on June 2nd, Joan was spending the night at Jesse's apartment, and the subject of this police officer came up. Jesse said he was going to ask him if he was married or not, and if he was married, he would break things off with him. This was three days before the murder, so we have two motives here, not to be outed and not to end the relationship. Now, the breakup may not seem like persuasive enough of a motive, but outing the affair certainly would have been. It would have been the end of Steve's career and likely his marriage. A police officer having sex with a defendant is just not okay. And now we have that same defendant thinking the officer would take care of his ticket because of the relationship. This is making the sex transactional. And it makes you wonder if Jesse would have had sex with Stephen Rios 
if he wasn't in a position to make that charge go away. We don't know one way or the other, but the power imbalance here cannot be ignored. Steve would have lost everything. A solid motive to be sure, and now DNA on Jesse's body. The investigator zeroed in on him, which is a move Steve would call getting tunnel vision. On July 1st, 2004, 27-year-old Stephen Rios was arrested for the murder of Jesse Valencia. It was less than a month after the murder. He was held without bond at Fulton State Hospital, where he was already receiving mental health treatment. The theory of the crime was that Steve left the station in the early morning hours and drove to Jesse's apartment. He would normally just stop by without calling first, so not finding a phone call in Jesse's phone records was not surprising. Jesse confronted Steve like he told his friends he was going to do. A short physical altercation occurred in the apartment, leading to the noises the neighbor heard, which included someone saying, stop it, stop it. Jesse made it out of the apartment and ran for help. Steve chased him down and grabbed him in a chokehold like he learned through his police training. As Jesse struggled, Steve's arm hairs were pulled out and bruises were left on Jesse's body. Once he had Jesse unconscious, Steve pulled out a serrated clip knife he had on his side and cut Jesse's throat. Steve then somehow got away, taking no forensic evidence with him and only leaving a small amount behind. Steve's home and car were searched, and none of Jesse's blood was found anywhere. They even tested the drains in the sink and shower. They never found the murder weapon. They never found any blood on Steve's clothes. The clothes he provided for testing were consistent with the ones his fellow officers said they saw him wearing, so it doesn't appear like he switched clothing. So rather than doing a blow-by-blow of the trial, let's just go ahead and lay out the evidence against Steve that's showing he's guilty, and then the evidence that points away from guilt. On the guilt side, we have a motive. A motive is not necessary to prove in court, but it is helpful for a jury. And then we have the DNA. It was definitely Steve's DNA, and he was going to have to convince this jury how and why his DNA was on Jesse nearly a week after he last saw him. Those are honestly the two big pieces for me. For the investigators, we also have the threats of suicide and also Steve lying about the relationship after the murder. But like I said, I think Steve had motive to lie about those things that were unrelated to a murder. Now, the evidence pointing towards not guilty is what isn't there, which is forensic evidence behind that small amount of DNA. No forensics from the scene transferred to Steve, his house, or his vehicle, which seems unlikely. No murder weapon was found. They did have some people say they thought Steve carried a knife on his belt, but that knife was never found. And looking at dash cam footage of Steve on duty that night, there's no knife on his belt. And then we have the counter to the DNA. The defense did not say this wasn't Steve's DNA. They accepted that. However, experts have said it's impossible to know how long a small amount of DNA could have lasted under Jesse's fingernails. As for the arm hairs, Steve's hairs weren't the only ones found on Jesse. They were just the only ones that could be matched. And when Jesse's comforter was bagged and taken into evidence, they found more hairs on it that were not Jesse or Steve's. The defense for these hairs was that they transferred from the comforter to Jesse's body. He hadn't washed his comforter in the six days since Steve was last there. And then we have this incredibly tight timeline. We're really looking at 30 minutes to go to Jesse's, commit the crime, completely clean up all the blood evidence, and show back up at home. We have no idea where he would have even cleaned up. Now, you can decide for yourself if you believe Libby, Steve's wife. I accept She is setting this timeline, and she's also setting what state Steve was in when he got home. Now, personally, I do believe her. If she did know a murder was committed and was helping Steve cover it up actively, why didn't she say he was home even earlier and just completely close that timeline? She could have exonerated him with the timeline, but she didn't. And when Libby was initially asked if she knew what time Steve got home, She appeared to have no idea why she was being asked that. 
Steve didn't tell her about the affair or the connection to this murder victim until after it was in the paper. Now, if I was Libby, my temptation would be to say, nope, didn't see him come home, didn't see him all day. By the way, you might want to check his alibi for the Zodiac killings. And then I could just move on with my life. But Libby is clearly a less spiteful person than I think I am. So we're going to go into trial with Libby on the list of witnesses for the defense. Even though she and Steve were headed to divorce due to this affair, she was prepared to defend him over the murder charges. Before the trial could even happen, though, a special prosecutor had to be assigned to the case. With Steve Rios being a former police officer who knew the prosecutors in Colombia, they had to make sure there was no appearance of impropriety. They went across the state in one direction to get the prosecutor, and then they went in the other direction across the state to Clay County to get a jury. Clay County sits north of Kansas City, and there was just too much local media coverage of this case to find an impartial jury in the Columbia area. It wasn't just media attention about Steve Rios that caused issues, though it certainly did when we're talking about picking a jury. But the media coverage really hurt Jesse Valencia's family as well. The sensational side of the story won out far too frequently, both in Missouri and back in his rural hometown area in Kentucky. That's not to say the media necessarily ran these tabloid pieces. At least not a lot of them did. The Springfield News leader, from what I have seen, is one that stands out as doing a very good job sticking to the facts. But the information still led to gossip and judgments. A 23-year-old college student who goes to parties and has multiple sexual partners is not the stuff I clutch my pearls over. But in conservative towns in 2004, when Jesse's sexual partners were other men, that started taking over some of the discussions. Instead of discussing the actual issue here, which was his murder, possibly the power imbalance between a police officer and a defendant in a sexual relationship, there were things to discuss here that didn't have anything to do with Jesse's consensual sexual relationships. A kind, funny, intelligent man was chased down and brutally attacked, but because he had sex with men, people wanted to discuss that instead. So Jesse's mother, Linda, ended up doing a lot of interviews. She did them then, she does them now. And that's in part to halt this type of distraction. She wants people to really know and understand Jesse as a whole person. And I really admire her for that because if you check out the more recent coverage on this case, none of it is pearl-clutching, fainting couch BS like that. None of it. And I think Linda being there, participating in these programs, whether it's an oxygen program or Dateline or Forensic Files, I think that helps keep the entire conversation in check. And that's admirable because I can only imagine how painful it is for her to have to revisit this over and over again. Though I don't know that any of it can really compare to what she went through during the trial where she had to see graphic photographs of her son's body being shown to the jury. And there were some objections from the defense on these photos. Some of them were really graphic, and the defense argued that they were playing to the jurors' emotions more than providing relevant information. But the state did succeed in getting most of them in front of the jury, which meant most of them were also in front of Linda. We already went over most of the evidence and what came up at trial, but I do want to hit a couple points that are very important. One is the neighbor, Christopher. He set the timeline of the argument, and the first statement he gave to the police put the fight earlier in the evening between 3 and 4.30 a.m. We know Stephen Rios had a rock-solid alibi for this time frame. Now, at trial, Christopher was saying, eh, he wasn't so sure about the time. He had been drinking and was woken up to this noise. He thought it was still dark out, but he could have been mistaken. He really didn't know what time the incident happened, and it could have happened more like 5 a.m. Another important witness was Jesse's best friend, Joan. If you remember, she was there when Steve arrested Jesse and again when he came by his apartment. And Joan gives the jury the motive, both that Jesse said he was going to break things off if Steve was married and he was going to go to the police department if 
Steve didn't fix his ticket. Now, the defense said none of that happened. It was just hearsay that Jesse said he intended to do these things, and there was absolutely no proof he actually did any of them. Steve testified in his own defense, and no surprise, his testimony was he didn't do it. So in May of 2005, the jury took the case, and they deliberated for nine hours before finding Stephen Rios guilty of first-degree murder. In Missouri, the only option in a non-capital first-degree murder trial is life without parole, so that is what Stephen Rios was sentenced to. One juror spoke to the media afterwards and said that Steve taking the stand didn't do him any favors. He just did not come across as genuine. The juror also acknowledged that the timeline was tight, and it was something that the other jurors were concerned about. However, he was familiar with the area and thought that the other jurors may have been thinking about Kansas City traffic, where they were from, and not Columbia traffic. He explained to them at 4.45, 5 a.m., the streets would have been clear in Columbia, and Steve could have easily driven the route. After sentencing, Steve, for his own safety, having been a police officer in Missouri, was sent out of state to serve his sentence. That way, he wouldn't accidentally run into anyone he had arrested. Libby, to her credit, allowed visits with their son, though she wasn't a fan of visiting him in prison herself. It was her parents who also supported Steve's innocence who would bring him up to South Dakota to visit his father. Meanwhile, Steve filed his direct appeal. This is the appeal that attacks whatever happened at trial that may have been an error. Steve had four points, but we're only going to discuss one of them because that's the one that worked. When Joan testified as to what Jesse told her, it was hearsay. That is accepted. It was an out-of-court statement offered to prove that Jesse was going to confront Steve about his marriage, his job, or both. Hearsay is generally not allowed in court, but there are exceptions to this. The state said Jones' testimony fit an exception. The defense said these statements did not, and the trial judge opted to let them in. Steve's appeal said that the trial judge erred in letting it in. So one exception to the hearsay rule is the state of mind exception, a statement that gives an idea of a person's state of mind can be admissible in limited situations, but the relevancy has to outweigh the prejudicial effect. But the problem with this is Joan's testimony about what Jesse said had nothing to do with Steve's state of mind. It had to do with Jesse's, and Jesse didn't commit a crime, so his state of mind was largely irrelevant. So this exception does not apply. The second exception that could be applied here is the future acts exception, and the appellate court gave a really good example of how this works using a Missouri case, so we are going to use that one. A woman named Andrea Jones was on the phone talking to a friend named Jacqueline when her estranged boyfriend, Terry Newsom came into the house. Andrea and Terry lived together, but Andrea had told him repeatedly to leave and he wouldn't stay away. So at this point, on the phone with Jacqueline, Andrea said she was going to get off the phone and tell Terry to leave. Four days later, after no one had heard from Andrea, her mother went to her house to look for her. She found Andrea dead in her bed. Terry Newsom was later convicted of murder. Jacqueline, the friend on the phone, testified at Terry's trial that Andrea said she was going to tell Terry to leave and that was, according to the state, the motive for the murder. So this sounds pretty similar to Jesse's situation. The victim said they were going to confront someone, and then they ended up murdered. Except, Jesse said he was going to break things off if Steve was married three days prior to his murder. He didn't tell anyone he was going to do it right away, and for the hearsay exception to apply, it has to be a more direct line from statement to assumed action than that. The statement has to be made in immediate proximity to the carrying out of the act. Joan had also testified that the night Jesse said he was going to confront Steve the next time he saw him, Jesse also said if Steve came over, he wouldn't answer the door and would pretend to be asleep that night. So unlike in Andrea Jones's murder, Jesse had no intention of confronting Steve immediately. 
And this all applies to Jesse threatening to go to the police department if Steve didn't get the ticket taken care of. Because Jesse made that statement even further out. He made it two weeks before the murder. Jesse was pretty open about this relationship with his friends, particularly Joan, and he had not told her that he did confront Steve over this. And the appellate court points out that Jesse's statement wasn't a direct, if you don't take care of the ticket, I'm going to the police department. It was rather, I have a secret they might want to know. I mean, the implication is there that he was going to go to the police department, but when you're looking at hearsay exceptions, an implication that he might do something later just is not enough. So the appellate court said these two statements should not have been allowed in at trial. That's the first step to a successful appeal. The judges agreed an error was made. But was it a big enough error that it may have changed the outcome of the trial? The court said yes. They granted Stephen Rios a new trial in April 2007. The second trial was held in 2008. It was mostly the same evidence with a few key differences. Obviously, one was the hearsay testimony was not allowed in. The defense also took a deeper look at the other suspects and illustrated even more that they weren't really investigated. Ed's roommate, Eric, four years later, was a lot shakier on his testimony about whether or not he was home when Ed got there. And the police search of Ed's apartment was, according to the defense, subpar. Ed's DNA was found under one of Jesse's fingernails and elsewhere on his body and elsewhere in his apartment. There was more of Ed's DNA there than Steve's. Plus, Ed was admittedly one of the last people seen with Jesse. He was also a chef, and like a lot of chefs, he had his own knife set. Jesse was killed with a knife. So you would think Ed would really be looked at, and his knife set would have been something they would have wanted to find. On a search of Ed's apartment, they did not find that knife kit. However, Ed said it was in his room where he always kept it. So either Ed is lying or the police didn't really search his place all that well. Knowing the defense was going to point right at Ed, the prosecution did put him on the stand to demystify him to the jury. And honestly, even people looking back on this case now from an innocence perspective don't seem to think Ed did it. Just that he should have been investigated more and he wasn't in spite of his DNA being found, in spite of him being a chef with knives, and the fact that he wasn't illustrates the tunnel vision the police had, not that people think Ed did it. Another change at trial number two was that Libby's testimony altered. It was a small alteration, but also significant. She testified this time that the clock she looked at when getting up with her baby was actually five to seven minutes fast, meaning Steve got home earlier than she originally said. Remember, this timeline is already very tight. If you take five minutes away from Steve, he probably could not have done this crime. We know changing testimony is never a good thing. But Libby said she actually realized her initial error to the police before the trial. But Steve's attorney told her, don't change her story because then it would look suspicious. And he wasn't wrong because that's exactly how it looked at the second trial when she did change her story. And the prosecution pounced on this, using it as a way to undermine her credibility. Steve did not testify in his own defense during trial number two. A juror in the first trial said he didn't do well on the stand. Steve's own father and his trial attorney from the first trial also didn't think he did well. So his new attorney advised against it in the second trial. Steve would later say that he actually wanted to testify, but his attorney closed out their case before calling him as a witness. So the jury took the case and deliberated for six hours before they came back with a guilty verdict, but not to first-degree murder this time around, but to second-degree murder. In Missouri, juries are always allowed to consider all lesser offenses, though the state certainly tried to prove first-degree murder. This made a big difference in sentencing. Stephen Rios was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole, plus 23 years for armed criminal action. He will be eligible for parole in 2035 when he is in his late 50s. Under his original conviction, he had no hope at all of release. 
Steve appealed the new conviction in 2010, but the court upheld the verdict. Steve's son, now a teenager, still visits him in prison, and the fact that Steve has family supporting him and his innocence keeps him going. As for Libby, she told Dateline it would be easier if she thought Steve was guilty because she and her son could just cut him off and move on. Instead, they are in this limbo that just feels so unjust and unfair. It's a place where families who believe their loved ones were wrongfully convicted also live. As for Jesse Valencia's family, they don't believe Steve Rios' claims of innocence. And Jesse's mother wrote a letter to the editor of her local paper expressing the pain the second trial caused. More appeals and post-conviction relief petitions will continue to bring Jesse's family more pain. I wish we could review cases, appeal unfair rulings, and provide investigations into claims of actual innocence without hurting the victim's families more. But there really doesn't seem to be a way to do that. The needs of both sides are just in direct opposition. The criminal justice system sometimes compounds the tragedy, and maybe there is a better way to balance the interests of the victims and the defendants to prevent that, but I don't know what that way is. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this case. Do you think Stephen Rios is guilty? And even if you do think he's guilty, do you think there was enough evidence to convict him? As always, you can comment under my Instagram or Facebook posts on the case, tag me on Twitter at Crime Lines Podcast, or email crimelinespodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Crime Lines is also on YouTube, where I post two to three true crime videos a week, including an occasional after show where we go over any visuals from that week's podcast episode. Crime Lines is also on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. And if you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an occasionally funny history, mystery, and true crime podcast that I co-created and write for. 